Good morning. So I've been looking up here and I've been enjoying the, the flowers uh, left over from yesterday's gathering in honor of Greg. And I'm, but I'm still looking at the front of the building and saying, this is something wrong. It's not quite right. Why didn't the front look? It doesn't look quite right. And I just realized sitting here that we're missing our flowers that are normally here. So they're back here. I could go get them. I probably should just because. I want to thank, thank you for yesterday's uh, honoring of, uh, of Greg Neeson. Um, and it continued long after uh, the gathering itself. Um, Greg uh, touched and served thousands of people uh, in uh, a, a wide variety of ways as we got to enjoy hearing yesterday. Thank you for that. But one of the most poignant uh, ways was his generosity. Uh, a young lady last night put a beautiful uh, testimony to his generosity on Facebook. And I hope you have a chance to read that. Um, so not everything got to be said here together, uh, but uh, uh, we all are touched how much uh, that man served out at camp, in our homes, in his home, brought us all over. On and on and on it went uh, with uh, how he cared for people. So thank you for yesterday and honoring him. We get to participate a little bit with that today uh, with the flowers uh, and just the encouragement of knowing that a life lived, well lived in Christ is really a blessed, joyful life. I, uh, I got a cup of water just a little while ago. Tom brought me this. And it was so sweet and unexpected, he almost choked me up. I think of Jesus saying, if you bring a cup of water to one of these little ones of mine, you will not lose your reward. A cup of water isn't just a cup of water, you know. You did know that, didn't you? A cup of water in the hand of somebody walking with Christ is not just a cup of water. It's a testimony. It's a, it's a declaration. It's a connection. It's a presentation of the power of God from one person on this globe put into the hands of another. A cup of water with Christ is never a cup of water. Now, Tom will probably rib me later on and say, I was just trying to get you to hurry up with your sermon, Robert, and not, not spend any time coughing or repeating yourself. But that's just Tom. But that's the other part of what a cup of water is. It's joy and laughter and connection. We talked last week about fellowship. And I sat down and I said, oh, I didn't get to so many things. So this week we're going to talk about fellowship. And I'll try to wrap it up succinctly. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy Lord, dear Father, thank you so much for the powerful, powerful way you give us to connect with one another. Father, help us to love and to serve and to never quit, never, ever quit uh, the walk that you've given us in, in front of us. Help us to learn today uh, your will uh, uh, in our, uh, our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we ended with this, living out the koinonia, the fellowship. We are members of one another. Therefore, be devoted to one another. This is a, a tiny paraphrase of picking up of two verses out of Romans 12. So I want to review last week uh, what we talked about. Uh, we, we talked about how fellowship is created, specifically created by God, 1 John chapter 1. That it's uh, built into a close uh, serving relationship, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, that, it's, uh, that it creates unity, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Galatians 2 and 1 Corinthians 1. That it contributes to the needs of others, that the very collection that the church uh, participated in was called fellowship. That it was a sharing, a communal sharing of their own financial resources so that other Christians wouldn't go hungry. They called that Fellowship, 2 Corinthians 8 and ch chapters 8 and 9, uh, that it was 
uh, the, the fellowship we did. And so everything we did a little while ago, the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the collection, uh, and this gathering itself is all fellowship. So actually, Scott Crockett is probably responsible for three quarters of what we do here as a deacon responsible for fellowship. But we don't generally hand it that way, handle it that way. Uh, we handle these as separate events, but they're all part of the unity of the oneness that we're supposed to have in Christ, and that in fact the early church was devoted to one another and was devoted to fellowship. What we don't tend to remember or to notice is that fellowship is much bigger and more important uh, than we know. It's really a matter of life and death. It's really a matter of life and death. The unity we're supposed to have. I've told you all the story uh, years and years ago uh, of the young woman who came in to talk to you, but I was the only one here, so they came and met with me. But they wanted it, She wanted to come back to church. She'd been attending church in Texas as a little girl, uh, got mixed up with a guy and had a few children, and he's abandoned her. And so here she is with... Um, with these little children, uh, and I tried to find good ways for her to come, and she said, yes, I want to, and I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I used to go all the time, but my family stopped going. My grandfather had a fight with somebody at, at church, and he refused to go back, and so mom and dad stopped going, and nobody ever took me, but I know I should be. I know I should be. And we had this conversation, and that's the last time I ever saw her. No name. I didn't have a phone number. She didn't have a cell phone. Please come back. Let's talk again. And I thought about her grandfather. And whatever division, whoever was at fault, whatever it was, how a single division, a single division in the fellowship of our body has affected four generations right in front of me, not to mention these children's children. It is, it is a matter of life and death. It is serious. We cannot let divisions and hurts and misunderstandings and our own druthers Get in the way of the powerful oneness, unity, and the sharing of our lives that God intends us to have. Romans, Romans 15, if you will. Turn to Romans 15. Okay, got noisy pages. You've got to turn pages. If you have an electronic Bible, you get the page turning app that makes the noise. So it sounds like you're turning pages. Romans 15. Romans 15, now we who are strong, verse 1, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. For each of us is to please his neighbor. For each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, for his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. Whenever I read this verse, I that this part of Romans, that verse stops me. I think about how shallow I am and how selfish I am and how I really want things my way. I walk into one of the rooms of our house and I've got a teenager sitting in my chair. And they're not jumping up. Now Adam would never do this, so I can't. Why isn't this person jumping up and getting out of the way? That's where I want to sit. We have this very fundamental I want built into our lives. For each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please 
himself. Now, I'm all for teenagers jumping up when their dads walk in the room, but that's a different issue. I'm just talking about my problem of wanting my own chair. Indeed. Indeed. Verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. Now may the God of all, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be the first of the same mind with one another, according to Jesus Christ, so that with one accord, you may with one voice, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the, uh, to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of, the, of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy as it is written. If you didn't recognize it before, recognize it in this verse. Paul is writing to the Romans to fix an ethnic problem. He's got a social division built in to, to the early churches. It's the Jewish-Gentile division. It's, the, it's the, 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 the resistance of being mixed together. Those Jews were strange people, you know. You didn't necessarily want to be mixed in with them. Well, those Gentiles don't even know God or how to follow him or to how to obey his laws. Why would we participate in anything with them? And that was so built into the fabric, we have to be reminded over and over and over again in the New Testament to be united and to be in fellowship because God created the fellowship we didn't. We're simply participating into it. And then he gives us four Old Testament verses to the Jews who say the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the Gentiles. Verse, uh, verse 9, God, give praise to you among the Gentiles. Verse 10, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Verse 12, who arise to rule over the Gentiles. He's telling the Jews God always was in, intended that all people be his people. Not just your one nation. Well, we have so many divisions among us. Social, ethnic, uh, uh, economic, racial, language, educational, all kinds of things. Verse 13. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Concerning you, my brethren, I myself am also convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness and full, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. He's calling for us to be close enough to know each other's lives, to know each other dearly and closely and carefully, and to sound off with one voice in our worship of God, one voice in our praise to God, one uh, a congregation in peace and in unity, active and in fellowship with one another. We cannot do this alone. Don't try. Going alone is to die. We are to be part of his body, part of his church. Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews chapter 10. It's getting more poignant in our lives because the politics of today, the media of today, seems to be getting more and more splintered. Divisions among people are highlighted. A newspaperman doesn't run around and look for stories about people getting along with other people. He doesn't look for, for businesses wherever all the employees are happy and work uh, cooperatively together. He doesn't look for college for campuses where the students go quietly to the dorm to the dorms and to classes and work together. They look for trouble, and the trouble raises to the surface. And when you've got politicians like some we've got today who want to emphasize every division out there and and kind of crowbar against them, it gets worse. We in Christ have to be uh, 
completely united, closely, lovingly caring across all the divisions that the world gives us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. That's just an amazing statement all by itself, that you get to enter into the holy of holies of the temple. But we won't be able to go there today. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and your bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. This verse is not a verse that, about you have to go to church. It happens to say that right in the middle. Right in the middle, it says, don't stop meeting together. Don't stop assembling. Don't stop because you need the encouragement. You need the one anothering. You need the, the, the spurring one another on to love and good deeds. You need to give it, and you need to receive it. One of my favorite studies, if you've been around me at any time, you know it, is a, is a study of the 72 New Testament one another's. 72 one another commands. They're all in the command form. We have 72 one another commands. Love one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Encourage one another. Building up one another. Forgiving one another. Be of the same mind toward one another. Singing to one another. Members of one another. Peace with one another. Serve one another. Wash one another's feet. Be, be at peace with one another. Be devoted to one another. Give preference to one another. Accept one another. Admonish one another. Wait for one another. Have the same care for one another. Showing tolerance for one another. Be kind to one another. Be subject to one another. Be, uh, uh, treat one another as more important than yourselves. Bearing with one another, give comfort to one another. Be which do that which is good to one another. Stimulate one another. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. With humility toward one another, have fellowship to one another. That's all the positive ones. The negative ones is don't hate one another. Be helpful to one another. Do not betray one another. Do not judge one another. Do not have lawsuits with one another. Stop depriving one another. Do not bite or devour one another. Be not consumed by one another. Do not challenge one another. Do not envy one another. Do not lie to one another. Do not speak against one another. Do not complain to one another. Did you write those down? Now, Mark was probably counting, and he said, Robert, that was only 31. You're right. That was only 31 because they're repeated, and there's 72 of them altogether. 16 of them are love one another, for example. Don't do this by yourself, don't pull away from the church ever, ever, ever. It hurts. It's hard. Hebrews 10, verse 32. Remember the former days? You remember back then when we used to have really good fellowships? You endured great conflict and suffering. You were made a public spectacle. This is what Alex read for us a minute ago. You were sharers with those who were made public spectacles. You showed sympathy to the prisoners. You joyfully accepted the seizure of your property. Remember those good days? They came and took away your home and your property. Knowing that you yourselves, you joyfully, you joyfully accepted the seizure of your property. Knowing that you yourselves have a better possession. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. I'm in verse 35 or Hebrews 10. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. So when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Yet for a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live, my righteous one shall live 
by faith. But if he shrinks back, my soul has no fellowship, no pleasure, excuse me, no pleasure with him. You can add 2 Timothy 1.7 to that. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. We are not of those who shrink back. We have fellowship and oneness, especially in times of trouble, when our brothers and sisters are being arrested and thrown in prison, and when some of our houses are being kicked in by the authorities and our property is being taken because we're Christians, or whatever reason. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, verse 39, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. We are not of those who pull back away from people. We are not of those who shrink back in our faith. We are those who push ahead, who draw closer to one another, who make sure we don't have particular uh, difficult persecutions as a group right now, but we will. I don't know what Satan is planning, but he's planning. And he intends that you don't feel united with one another. I don't know what's going on in your personal lives, but I know every time things that seem to really crest and really be encouraging and really being, being made good, there's some really awkward, difficult wedge shoved between Carol and I, and we have to fight our way around it to tr figure out how to understand each other again. Satan is living and active, and he is trying to pull us apart in every way he can. Carol and I are doing great. But there are painful times where we look at each other and say, why are we fighting? Why is this so hard? Why don't we understand each other? And we pull each other close and say, Father, help us to see Satan's work and to stand united against him. Satan is trying to harm you and harm this congregation. Why do we shrink back from fellowship? We say, I'm not good at people skills. I'm not very good at this. Uh, my parents taught me not to, uh, to talk to strangers, and, and, and we always left right away from church, or, or I never, never felt close to people, or people hurts too much. I'll get to that one in a second. I've tried. Nobody talks to me. I sit all by myself. Nobody wants me to help. I tried to volunteer, but they don't seem to want my help. We come up with entire lists, and I guarantee every mistake that we can make as a, as a congregation, we've made. Every, every relationship problem that you could create, we've created, and we'll probably continue to create more. But that's only because we're weak, fault-filled, and failing uh, uh, humans. But we want to be united. We want to be close. Never, ever give up on trying to have closer relationships. You are part of a body tied to one another. I've been hurt too many times by churches. I tell you what, you can get hurt a lot more inside of a church than you will by people outside the church. And you will be hurt. You will be hurt. A lie told in this room between two people that hurts another is a hundred times more painful than a lie told by somebody else outside. A gossip, we don't have a place that gossips, we don't have a place that lies, but you know what I mean. Gossip. We'll, we'll stab you in the side, the back, the chest, the heart, all at once. I've been hurt too many times. Well, Satan is really good at hurting people. Never quit. I'm, I'm too busy. We're too busy. Do you realize how many things are going on in our lives? And, and our, lives, our, our week is filled with two adults trying to get to work and back, and the kids have so many things going on. When it comes to a, doing something else over the weekend, we just don't have time. I can't give all of my time away. I've got to have some time. It feels shallow. It feels fake. I don't think it's sincere. I'm not close to people. Do it anyway. Push forward anyway. I've got friends. I've got friends, and I'm busy with my other friends. Uh, but they're not united with you in Christ. They're not part of the same body that you're part of. Your friendship with them is not a life and death issue. Fellowship is much more important and powerful. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, quickly. Think, the, think an apostle would get this right? 
You think an apostle would know how to fellowship with people and how to be united with the church? Paul writes in Galatians 2, verse 11, when Cephas came to, as Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to his coming, certain men from James, he used to, coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. There's your problem again, that ethnic division. He used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that not even Barnabas, excuse me, that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of them all, if you being a Jew live like Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Paul caught Peter walking a hypocritical pathway. The apostle Peter could not stand against the judgment of other Christians. And so when other Jewish Christians came around, he stopped hanging around the Gentiles. He stopped being friends with his own brothers and sisters. I don't know who left the church over this stuff, but could you imagine being a judge this way, being isolated this way? As soon as some Jews walk through the door, people won't talk to you anymore. Ah, but you got to be strong in Christ. you got to know where the right is and never quit his church. Even though Peter was completely in the wrong, you don't leave the body because an apostle got it wrong. You think an apostle would always get it right. An apostle completely botched it. Judgmental, divisive, hypocritical, unloving, uncaring, wrong, deep wrong, congregation dividing wrong, the apostle Peter. And thank God Paul was there to see it. Uh, uh, spoke to him face to face in front of everybody. How do you think that went? And then he wrote to us about it. Or at least to the Gentiles. No, we never quit. We never give up. In 3 John, we read about a man named uh, Diotrephes. After Paul, uh, excuse me, John praises other men in that same congregation who are accepting people, who are taking in strangers, who are being uniting. He talks about Diotrephes, who loves to be first in verse 9. For this reason, I if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, unjustly accusing us of wicked words, not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren. He forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Diotrephes' effect on the, on the congregation was to divide people from each other, refusing to accept apostles' teachings, refusing to accept people who arrive at the congregation, and even throwing people out of the, out of the church. Remember Jesus told us, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Oswald Chambers writes something about fellowship. In regard to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, which reads, Do you not know that you are not your own? Don't you know you're not your own? Don't you know that you're not your own? You don't even own yourself. There's no such thing as a private life, he writes. Or a place to hide in this world for a man or a woman who is intimately aware of the sharings and sufferings of Jesus Christ. God divides the private lives of his saints and makes it a highway for the world. In Christ, you don't get to have a private life. First of all, God and Jesus are right in the middle of it. But Oswald Chambers says he, he opens up your private life and makes it a highway for the world and for himself. No other human being can stand that unless he has identified with Jesus Christ. We are not sanctified for ourselves. We are called into intimacy with the gospel, and things happen that appear to have nothing to do with us, but God is getting us into fellowship. 
into fellowship with himself. Let him have his way. If you refuse, you will be of no value to God in his redemptive work in the world. You'll end up being a hindrance and a stumbling block. The first thing God does is get us grounded on strong reality and truth. He does this until our cares for ourselves individually have been brought into submission to his way. Why shouldn't we experience heartbreak under those conditions? Through those doorways, God is opening up ways of fellowship with his son. Most of us collapse under the grip of pain. We sit down at the door of God's purpose to either a slow death through self-pity and our so-called Christian sympathy of others helps us to our deathbed. But God will not. He comes with the grip of, a, of the pierced hand of his son as if to say, enter into this fellowship with me and shine. If a God can accomplish his purpose in this world through a broken heart, then why not thank him for breaking yours? God does not promise us an easy pathway. He promises us to be fulfilled and useful to his purposes. We told God that we would die to ourselves. That's what the baptismal death is all about. That cleansing we read about just a few verses ago. We die to self. <clears throat> We're buried in baptism. And a new person raises up, useful in God's hand, to do whatever it is we, he wants. So our growth in fellowship, how to grow. First of all, be determined. Set your mind and be determined that you will be a person who connects and serves others. You'll be a unifying force. And your life will be a force to connect people to you and to Christ. Two, Approach it with prayer and scripture. Three, practice. In the grocery stores, in the lobby, in the fellowship hall, go sit with somebody you've never eaten with before or you don't know. Don't sit with the same people over and over again. Clear away conflicts and barriers in your own heart, in your own mind, and then in your schedule. Get the conflicts, get the barriers out of the way and be a force for unity and connection. Be prepared for discouragement because you will be discouraged. One, you'll be tired. Two, you'll start feeling sorry for yourself. Three, you'll walk into somebody who doesn't want to talk to you or they're in a bad mood or you get a load of burden that, from them that you weren't expecting or whatever it might be. Be prepared for discouragement because Satan is active and he's looking to discourage you. Keep the focus off of you and be a living sacrifice. We're members of one another. Therefore, be devoted to one another. Thank you for so much for your loving attention in these lessons. We must remember that our fellowship is not for our purposes. It's not for our fun. This isn't a bowling league. This isn't a sports club. This isn't a social gathering. We are the family of God, and our purpose is to love one another for his glory and to reach the lost so many can know him. So all of this is for what he needs and what he wants. And in the Antioch, a model of the church, we're to be a solid foundation for people to come learn about God and people to go from here and teach others about God. If anyone here has not, been, has not been baptized into Christ, we offer you this time to do so. If you have any other needs that we can help you with, please come forward and let us know while we stand and sing.